we will get started here. I know people will continue to join. One of the beautiful things about our webinars is that no matter when you join, it will be great. So as people trickle in, they can join us. Please, if you have any chats or comments throughout our webinar, feel free to put in the chat per usual. Welcome, the fate of food, what we'll eat in a bigger, hotter, smarter world. This is EBCO's executive book club. It's our most popular initiative. I hope you loved this book. I was just pleased to see how gorgeous it was before I even opened it. So welcome. I hope you enjoyed reading this. We are so excited to dig in right now. For those of you who might be new, I see a lot of super fans, so thank you. If you are, in fact, new because our book club is ever-growing and thriving, just know that this is all about inspiration for innovation. It's about creativity. It's about the motivation to look outside and find new signals, new trends, new inspiration for the things that you're working on day in and day out. We bring together a group of innovators, people who are cross-category. They're leading in innovation, pipeline development, category management marketing, insights, you name it. They are on this call, which is what just pumps us up every time we get to do this. Some topics that we've covered in the past, we've done everything from creativity, spirituality, Gen Z. We've covered technology and beauty and wellness, and we're forever thinking of new topics to cover. So if anything inspires you, please send it our way. You never know when it'll pop into the next book club. We are a trend-powered innovation firm, and we are founded on the principle that innovation requires a new way of thinking that leverages trends and insights. And that is what EBCO is all about. And you can see that we work across all industries with all sorts of clients. Some of you on the call we've worked with. So please, um, if you're new, let's partner, let's add you to the mix. We love working with everyone, all industries. And here, our latest pick, The Fate of Food, What We'll Eat in a Bigger, Hotter, Smarter World by Amanda Little. And she is an awesome author if you enjoyed this book as much as I did. Awesome. Yeah, so to tell you a little more about Amanda, we were excited that she really has studied journalism from a food perspective. So a lot of her work, as we'll see in the topics we'll cover today, focus on things like energy, technology. I really appreciated that she was able to connect the dots between what all the signals are telling us today and to what the future could look like. And then, as you know, with all of our book clubs, we also apply our secondary research filter of what we're hearing an expert say, but then also what does this mean specifically for our clients? So we'll be bridging that gap today to really talk about what we heard in the book, but also what we see coming and what some of the innovation opportunities can be. So we had this slide that we added about what if, what if, like what happens when some of this, the food items that we love or that we're used to become extinct. So in the book, it talks specifically about some crops that are at risk, some of the food and supply chain issues that we have, but we've already started to hear kind of mumblings of a few food areas where People are worried about what the future of that category could look like. So by 2050, the amount of suitable farmland for coffee will be cut in half. That sounds really drastic when you think about it. The price of coffee has risen about 38% in the last three years alone. And people think that with the warming climate, more fungus, just less available land, that this could become a really big dilemma. It's one of the most popular um, drinks on the planet. Avocados. So I read some crazy stat lots of articles about what avocado future looks like. And some people predict that it might be $8 for an avocado by 2050, just really showing how it could become a luxury item to have certain fruits and vegetable items. And even now we're starting to get things like freak hail storms where there's a like hundred million dollars worth of damage done to the crops that happened in Mexico. Um, and in the worst of the California drought, Chipotle considered taking guacamole off the menu. Uh, and we've even heard from clients at a certain scale that they can't even get enough avocado inventory for the amount of scale that they have to have. Um, and when you think of like a McDonald's, when they have to have a food item on the menu, I mean, they almost take the whole like global supply of that one product. And so it starts to cause pricing and inflation on that item. And so what we kind of think is more widely available today with some of these climate impactors could become things that are more of a luxury and something that's considered higher end by and then the one that's really interesting to me is there's actually a whole book about this that we can um, find the link for if anyone's interested, but it's basically about the last banana. 
and this concept that other varieties of banana and other food have went extinct from funguses um, and other types of climate disasters that have happened with bugs. And so how, what happens if basically the number one fruit vegetable crop that we tend to eat worldwide suddenly becomes not available? Um, and they're very, I guess, susceptible to a certain type of fungus. So there's been a lot of experts that talk specifically about what will happen if, if we no longer have bananas and what that could look like. And that has definitely happened historically that we just in our lifetime have not experienced is that there have been crops or certain types of things that were very common for our way of eating that are just no longer available um, because of the either how they're farmed or what the business model is. But um, I think it's interesting because I remember a few years ago when the orange crisis happened where some type of fungus or pest took out most of the oranges in Florida and growing up I'd always seen um, at the grocery store where it would say like our oranges are from Florida and you would see a lot more variety of oranges than you do today and now if you go into the grocery store it's actually like a very small section because most of the entire crop was wiped out and so now they have to source oranges from other places so just interesting sometimes that we don't notice these things that kind of happen behind the scenes and obviously a very big deal for the agriculture community. But as a consumer, we're not always like privy to like why suddenly the supply changes or why there's less availability, um, especially on some of these items that we might think of as more seasonal. And I already some um, comments about uh, bananas, we would miss them so much. And basically even fruit companies deciding to focus on things like avocado, probably because I actually read that avocados was the most profitable fruit and vegetable item um, just because they're in, there's sort of like a whole avocado um, trade that happens now and even like fraudulent things that happen around it because of how much money it makes. So why does the fate of food matter? So we'll talk today about sourcing. So we see a lot more demand on sourcing where it comes from. Is this actually something that's sustainable? I read this really interesting um, post on Instagram that I cannot verify how accurate it is, but I thought it was an interesting idea, is they said, is it better to eat beef locally, um, like within a 50 mile radius, or is it better to have cashew milk, which comes from Thailand? And I thought that was such an interesting concept because sometimes we think like, oh, we're having a nut-based milk and that's better for the environment, um, but maybe not, you know, maybe locally sourced beef would actually win out on the carbon footprint there. So it's just interesting to see how our choices, like sometimes we think we're being sustainable or we're doing something better, or we're eating plant-based, but it actually is doing more damage than just eating locally. So we're starting to see more awarenesses come around our perceptions of what actually is helpful. The technological revolution, so things like robot sensors, 3D printing, we'll talk about today. So we're seeing a lot of technology come in to try to save agriculture and to try to make it more sustainable, but also obviously our population is still increasing worldwide. So we're having to keep adding to what we're able to produce today. Sustainability overall, um, and looking at that kind of tied back to sourcing and some of the decisions we're making on the types of crops we plant. And then obviously climate change being a big threat um, to most of our current production today. So today we'll talk about things like industrial crops, innovation we're seeing there, aquaculture, which is really interesting. I mean, there's been a lot of seafood documentaries lately on Netflix that we'll talk about and sort of the like the mafia when it comes to like overfishing and how there's a lot of diseases that have even wiped out things like salmon. Superfoods, so where we could see a future with things that are kind of these really resilient, drought resistant crops and, and foods that are growing really well in arid environments. Indigenous farming techniques. So we often hear that with the trends around regeneration as well as regenerative agriculture and looking back at how land was managed previously before, you know, it turned into big agri agriculture and big food. And then livestock. So when we kind of think about meat and where the future of that could and how it's becoming more lab-based overall. So some watershed moments in the history of agriculture, which I personally found so fascinating because not studying agriculture previously, I thought it was interesting just to see how we got to where we are today. Um, and the book goes into much of a deeper dive into this, but just at a high level view, um, you know, at 4,000 BC, Mesopotamians, the first farmers started cultivating seeds. And so this really took us away from our diet of foraging and started to be more reliant on what types of grain you could actually farm and produce at a more mass scale. So that was kind of the start of us moving towards a lot more simplified crops and rotations and some of the more like common things that we eventually get to now kind of started with this practice of cultivating seeds. 
around 700 AD, the modern food economy was established from Africa and China. We've seen throughout history, whichever civilization has is the most powerful often has the biggest food supply. So, I mean, you know, it's no, no surprise when you come to the United States, I mean, pretty much every food product um, in the grocery store is available um, and you, they source, source from like every other country. And so we start to think of these really complex um, areas, but then other parts of the world where, you know, there it's not as economic, then you start to see where there's, you know, potentially huge devastations anytime there is a drought or trade is down. And obviously we see that with Ukraine now not being able to supply grains um, to other countries that were more reliant on it. In the 1700s, we had the potato famine where it ushered in the first major panic over global food supplies. So this is where fertilizers are starting to be developed. We are starting to look at how to improve growing conditions and basically prevent mass starvation um, and some of the crises that came after. And that has kind of led us through just a whole wave of innovation up, up until this date on um, industrialization of farming, um, making it more corporate, um, the privatization of it, and all of the innovation we see in different kinds of devices and chemicals that can basically keep food alive in order to be able to feed this many people on the planet. And so in 2022, we're obviously feeling the weight of climate change today. And we're really in a precarious state of what do we need to be able to survive the next 100 years essentially and be able to feed everybody on this planet. So I'd really love in the chat if we're really curious if um, if what everyone kind of thinks about what the next 100 years will bring after reading the book, like where do you kind of see some of the biggest pain points and frictions that could come from the challenges that we face today? So some of the concepts we'll talk about are water innovation. So we've seen a lot of this from a cultural perspective, but also a lot of companies innovating on how much water they use. So you see that in beauty where there's waterless products. You see this in um, laundry even where things are more concentrated. So pretty much every category has started to think about how do we use less water and how do we conserve more waste, how to reduce food waste, um, which we actually talked to a leftover expert at EPCO a few um, projects ago. And I found it really interesting that they said, you know, a lot of food waste comes from at the consumer level, just buying too much food. And it doesn't really come from like trying to eat like all of your leftovers. So I just found that kind of a fascinating concept that we just tend to consume too much, um, especially in the United States and that we just overbuy. Um, and so, but at a corporate level, we'll talk later about just how there's a lot of food that just ultimately, you know, doesn't get purchased or is not a certain grade. And so there's just a lot of food that inherently gets wasted in the supply chain. Um, and then weather. So extreme weather and the impact on food production and quality of life, which we're seeing that, you know, with the drought conditions and just the extremity of weather that it can take out, you know, a lot of, a lot of available crops for that year. And that's becoming more predominant. So it's not just having one bad year, one bad season, but five. And so then how do you start to think of that differently in your, in your, the zone that you're in? There's this fascinating quote that we pulled from the book, and I love how she acknowledges that some of the innovation of the past was world-changing, world-altering, but it doesn't mean that it's going to suit us moving into the future. So 2 billion people might not exist if it hadn't been for the advent of agribusiness, which is fascinating to think about. There's also an increasing risk that the methods we've devised to feed billions more people are backfiring on the environment. So how do we take the past innovations and update them for a modern world? And now as we move into the content, I am so excited about how this webinar has been structured. We are looking at this through two parts. In part one, we're gonna explore the reality of challenges of climate change. And in part two, we're going to dig into where we wanna go. What are those solutions and technologies that will lead to a more sustainable future? So first, where we are, the reality and challenges of climate change. And we're gonna start with a poll. You know that we love our polls. How do you expect climate change to impact your industry. Oops. All right, here we go. The poll is up. I can see it impacting similar industries across the globe. Okay. Or my industry is directly impacted by climate change or little to no impact on my industry yet. I said those out of order, but hopefully you're reading the poll <laughs> and answering, answering accordingly. I see all of these responses coming in. Everyone's being very responsive. 
All right, here they come. So 70% of you are saying that your industry is directly impacted by climate change. That's huge. Similar industries, around 25% of you. And just 5%, I'd be curious who you are, but no impact yet on climate, from climate change. That's, that's pretty fascinating. So when we think of state of the climate, and we touched on this a bit, but warming trends. So Europe just had its hottest summer on recorded history, which we were seeing a lot in the news cycle about how a lot of these locations had not been built to keep heat out. They've been built to keep heat in with a lot of the stonework and the way that like some of these buildings were built hundreds of years ago at times. And so they were almost like hot boxes. And that's where the danger comes in is that we're not always, we don't have the best infrastructure for a lot of these changes that are going to be happening. Um, or even the fact that a lot of the audience may not have air conditioning or a way to have the type of air conditioning products that we have in other climates where we're used to keeping out humidity. West Asia is warming two times as fast as the rest of the world. And then the Southwestern US is in a record setting drought. So just seeing that global warming is very widespread and impacting a lot of areas that we traditionally use to grow agriculture. Food production now accounts for about a fifth of total greenhouse gas emissions annually. Agriculture contributes more than any other sector, including energy and transportation, which I personally find fascinating because sometimes you think of agriculture as something that is like in a way doing something good or it's like greenery, but overall just with the amount of chemicals and processes that are involved in it. Um, and it's causing so much of this climate change and so much of this energy and gases that we're seeing. And then the fight for the food system. So this is the single biggest threat of climate change is the collapse of food systems. So we think of, we learned a lot about this recently with COVID and Ukraine and Russia, but just that the, the collapse starts to happen when we can't source maybe dates from you know halfway around the world, or there's this one product that a grain that's in this one area. I was even reading how in the UK, they were saying that they can't offer fish and chips anymore as an economic food item. So it had started about, I might misquote this, but like 70 years ago, um, fish and chips kind of became this staple for hardworking families and middle-class families to be able to feed their families relatively cheaply and sort of became this nostalgic thing now, just like maybe the hamburger is for us, but um, families expect to be able to go and find fish and chips at their local pub uh, because a lot of that fish now comes from Russia. Um, they were finding that they have to source it now from somewhere else and the prices had doubled or even tripled in some cases. And so they weren't able to even offer that and that consumers have gotten used to the taste of the type of fish that they were sourcing from Russia. So they weren't able to find that exact fish anywhere else globally. So it's pretty crazy. We think of how big this world is that there really are like just certain ingredients that only exist in certain areas at that level of scale. And then so we start to have to rely on those really complex supply chains um, versus if we were eating more locally and more traditionally to what we have uh, hundreds of years ago. So interesting to think about in the future, if we'll kind of become more localized overall and our diets will have to adapt as a result, or, you know, the other side of it is that science innovates at a rate that we're able to lab produce most of these things that we currently get from around the world. So the facts are really hard to keep track of when it comes to this issue. We've outlined the realities of some of client changes impact on food production and some of the issues that we'll need to think about to be more sustainable and kind of this earth first future. So some of the pain points we heard about um, was this idea of farms um, and how farm owners make up only 1% of our population, but they manage about 40% of the country's land. It's an aging population. I even remember Obama talking about this when he was in office that we're kind of at this precipice of our family farmers going to continue or is it going to kind of all turn over to like privatized or corporate land. And they found in doing a lot of studies that many farmers aren't really talking about climate change, not all, but for the most part as a segment that they've had really these dire circumstances like drought, unseasonable weather, um, but oftentimes it's there's sort of this reliance on what has worked in the past and that has caused obviously friction with big cities. I mean, you always see articles about like LA and the farmers basically fighting over the water management. And so there's sort of this, this contrast where farmers may be feeling like they don't get the support they actually need and that they're kind of like fighting almost with the urban areas that are around them for water usage and for some of the things that will actually keep production alive. We've also saw a theme around elemental threats. So obviously drought, 
flooding stories are everywhere locally and abroad. Countries like India have tried to take more reactive measures to confront doubts like cloud seeding so that they could try to create some rain. Um, there are some really horrific stories of just how extreme the drought is over there. Um, and they have some of the highest rates of suicide in these communities because of the droughts, the drought pressure that they're under and how this has created almost a collapse of those systems in those areas. And we start to think of what could really be a societal collapse. It's when you know you don't have food and people just don't have enough to go around. And so we start to see it's definitely more extreme in areas like India where it's more arid, dry. Um, they have kind of the more, these have extremely high temperatures and, but kind of imagining what that could look like in 30 years in other areas of the world as well. We also have sort of an uncertain future in supply chain and how we're going to solve some of the challenges that have been uncovered during COVID um, and with other countries that, you know, politically or geopolitically, we, there starts to be issues um, and it starts to be used as a bargaining chip. So starting to think about how supply chains could be innovated on um, to be relocalized or do we start to change some of the patterns of how we get this, these products um, globally and worldwide? One area that we think is really interesting, and we have covered this a lot of times when we do sustainability investigations, is this idea of trash. And we've seen a lot of business models like Misfit Market, where they're innovating on giving consumers vegetables that look a little funky, like the carrots that you see there on the right and ways that we could reuse some of that waste so that it's not getting thrown out in the supply chain process. The value of food waste in America each year has been estimated between 162 billion and 218 billion. Safe but unsellable food is often um, thrown out instead of donated or donated in a way that's actually leveraged. A study found that 20% of all the fruits and vegetables produced in Minnesota gets thrown out because they don't meet our very narrow aesthetic standards. And I remember from, we worked on a tomato project years ago, and that was one of the things is that everything had to be a certain size, um, based like a certain amount of centimeters in order for it to meet standards. Otherwise it was thrown out or, and they were trying to think of ways that they could reuse that into like pasta sauces or ketchups or other products, but their brand necessarily didn't stretch into that space. And so it was going to be a huge effort, you know, internally with resources. And so we're starting to see now more coalitions formed of retailers and brands and how can they work together to start to think of some of these issues that impact communities. I've even seen some chain models now that are focused on like the economic impl implications of how do you maybe turn this into food products that could be sold at a community level and, um, and also thinking about the economic disparity that often happens with um, low income and not being able to afford fresh food products. As we mentioned earlier with water scarcity, we tend to think of water as a very free, unlimited commodity like air. But in other countries like Israel and Australia, there's tiered water pricing systems in order to make sure water is conserved. So it's interesting to think about how we potentially see a model like that here in the future. Um, living in Austin for several years, that was one thing that was very different than living in Ohio was that we had certain days that we could water our grass and then there was a water meter so that you couldn't go over. I've heard in Los Angeles and California now, some people are getting water restrictors put on them so that they can only use a certain amount of appliances at one time. And so we're starting to see more innovation and in just water efficiency overall. So that could be within our appliances, um, but eventually, you know, at a much, a much more mass scale where we start to think of even the product formats we're using and how much water is actually needed. And then sort of this is like a very fringe trend, but interesting space is this idea of like a post food world, which I'm hoping we're kind of moving more into this lab created where we're able to like recreate everything for ourselves. But there are some brands that are really pushing the boundaries of that. So Soylent, um, I don't know if this is that appealing to anybody, but we described it as like an adult baby formula. That's a complete meal replacement. So they predict a time where this could be piped into your house like water um, and it's sort of a zero waste meal that's very affordable. And we noted that the author tried it and enjoyed it. And I, we've had this in other, other work we've done. It's kind of a more extreme example of, of what could happen, but also could be interesting to think of um, as kind of what do we do to subsidize our nutrition potentially in the future. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to all of you. The chat is alive and well, and let's see if we can uh, add some conversation. So before reading The Fate of Food, what were your ideas about climate change's impact on our food systems? 
And how might those have changed since you read the book? Curious your thoughts. So think about what you thought climate change would be doing to food. And now some of your post thoughts, having read and learned everything Amanda Little had to share with us. Feel free to put it in the chat. Mm hmm. Yes, Jackie. So not realizing how it reaches into every corner of the world, but also didn't realize that there are solutions from every part of the world. Isn't that fascinating? There's more solutions than we're privy to. And she definitely shared some of those with us. All right. So as we continue on, if you have any thoughts, please continue adding them to the chat. Yeah. So one of these, one of the things to consider is this idea of the invention so this idea of deinventing food and returning to what pre-industrial standards were for organic and biodynamic farming practices. So we see that in some categories like cereal and grains, where they're kind of going back to this idea of investing in this biodynamic farming processes. Eminence Organic, which is one of my favorite beauty brands, they focus on the idea that they're biodynamic and regeneratively farmed in terms of all the ingredients they're putting into the beauty system. And they talk about how, as a result, when they get their products tested, that there's actually like 40% more minerals or that your body's actually able to absorb it. So they've done clinical studies to be able to prove that that is a better item for you to use. We also see um, another thing to consider is large scale solutions that explored by sustainable food advocates are relevant mostly to people who have the time, income, and creativity to cook from organic produce delivered direct to their door. So this idea that sometimes with de-invention, we get to things that are a lot more time costly. And so it might not be realistic to think that everyone's suddenly going to create a meal from scratch if we're used to this idea of convenient culture. So how do we start to take on that heavy lifting for them as brands? And we love this quote from B. Wilson, a food historian, that no one has yet discovered how to raise prices for the overfed without squeezing the underfed poor. So it's this idea that every time we raise prices for audiences that can absorb that, that we also then affect um, lower income consumers. So that would be like the idea of like, we raise avocado prices because it's not sustainable anymore to farm them, or there's only certain parts of the world, then, you know, suddenly you're impacting another consumer who is not able to access fresh food, maybe at the same volume. So starting to think about how can we create sustainable solutions to feed the masses um, and think of this as a mass problem, not just you know, a lot of the book talks about how a lot of these food prices could be a lot more expensive to eat this way. So eating meat in 2050 or eating avocado in 2050 could be like a luxury consumer doing that. And so how do we start to think of solutions that really scale down so that it's not just, we don't head towards a future where it's only fresh food if you can afford it. So we've seen a lot of tech and innovation. So Bill Gates said food is ripe for reinvention. There's a movement by a lot of big players in the tech space to really fund new methods of food production. We've seen entrepreneurs that are looking at things like plant genetics, aquaponics, artificial intelligence, so that they can start to think of how to build a more resilient food system. When innovators look at the current state of food production, some see 9 billion mouths to feed and they wanna capitalize off of the inherent basic need for food while others are more committed to changing the entire system and the entire environment. I think it's a really interesting way to think about it too because some of these, like we've seen with sustainability, it can sort of be a trend that people leverage to create kind of new white space in a category. But then we think of the entire system and there's a lot of opportunities to think about how we'd have to adapt it long-term um, versus just thinking of it as maybe a product idea or a quick win, but what's kind of the longer term implications yeah. of this. And I, a lot of times we talk about like horizon three planning, but I think it's interesting to think of this as like the next 50 years of innovation, like what's our roadmap to essentially get there. Um, and think about this much differently than we are today. So we see a respect for the resources of the land and the ingenuity, ingenuity of sustainable minded in innovators is really at the crux of the book and all of the trends it explores. So we'll be going into that in a little bit. All right, now we're heading into part two, the solutions and technologies leading to a more sustainable future. And I'm happy to say that we are here to bring some climate optimism and to expand your thinking about 
the future of food. And from Amanda Little herself, farmers, scientists, activists, and engineers the world over are radically rethinking food production. And I I would lump in innovators, insight leaders, market researchers, all of us are part of this as well, which is super exciting to think about. So eight trend areas in the fate of food that we'll be digging into. Soft on GMOs, robotics, IOT, the means of production, fishing, talking about meat, superfoods, our superheroes, and personalized and printed diets. I know someone brought that up in the chat, so excited to dig into that right now. Great. So the first one is on soft on GMOs. So we've seen GMOs face a lot of controversy. So we see a lot of brands that have a non-GMO label on their products. Trader Joe's and Chipotle are famous for swearing off using those or selling products that are made with GMOs. Yet the book and also in some of our research, we found that a lot of scientists and individuals believe this is like the future of where food is headed because of the climate and us not being able to you know, successfully produce enough food just from organic or biodynamic practices. So I love this quote on the left that it said, humans have been fiddling with plant genomes for thousands of years before farmers came along. Tomatoes were small and bitter, carrots were runty and pale, and grapes were pea-sized. I think it's interesting to think about how a lot of what we eat today is, is not the version that it was thousands of years ago. And also this idea that, you know, we oftentimes are correlating GMOs to things like cancer, but do we have to change our thinking in order to be able to continue to provide enough food at this large of a scale? Um, and also for countries that are ex facing extreme climate change. So we'll talk about like Africa in a second where that might be the only sustainable way to actually feed that many people. And so how do we start to think about this differently and make it potentially safer, make it more consumer friendly, understand and demystify GMOs overall. And I know there's a lot of controversy here and, and probably everyone has their own opinion of this, but I think it's a really interesting point. We had a project where um, they were talking about um, agriculture at a mass scale and how like, you know, it's great. We could organic farming, like that's a great trend, but we can't feed that many people if we do that. And so there's some definitely division on the sides of, of what actually can we do at a very, very mass scale. And we're talking about millions of people versus kind of one brand that maybe is leveraging this as a, as a core property. So one product we'll talk about is this drought Tigo. This is a type of drought resistant seed that's developed by Monsanto Bayer. And the seeds have proven to be an effective way to keep maize alive in harsh climates. So you think of these huge drought um, and flooding seasons, this is a product that's enabling them to actually be able to sustain that crop and not have it die off from the sun or not have it with the floods um, be drowned. But how can you really keep it alive with these extreme shifts? This quote um, from Dr. Rue says, Africa is trying to move away from the things were and to do that, they're really thinking about all the available tools they have due to some of these extreme climate change realities that they're facing. And maize, for example, it provides more than half of the calories consumed nationwide in Kenya. So just showing you what would happen if, you know, it was a devastated crop, then um, potentially famine and a lot worse impacts and, you know, potentially having something that's just a little bit GMO modified. So interesting to think of those two tensions pulling out one another. The next theme is robotics to the rescue. So we've seen automation as a signal across different categories, but in an industry like food production, it could potentially become a key innovation for precision that's needed to optimize miles and hundreds of miles of industrial fields. So there was an article in the New York Times recently that in agriculture, we're seeing more robots because essentially with less land, with fewer resources, with harsher weather, farmers have to really augment their technological intelligence. So we're just seeing a lot of robots that can test, that can analyze soil, that can help with plant management. The next example we'll show here, the sea and spray robot. This is one that's killing weeds with precision. So John Deere actually acquired this company for hundreds of millions of dollars because the robot's able to differentiate and scan and decide the difference between a crop or a weed. And then it can spray a very specific amount of herbicide. So thinking about the next frontier, it could be robots that treat each plant individually, not just with herbicides, but also with customized fertilizers, insecticides, irrigation, and you can start to see I could potentially use a lot less resources doing it that way, um, or maybe parts of the field that are, are experiencing a different um, a different type of um, fungus or a different type of pest that they're that they're experiencing. 
So the next trend we'll talk about is this idea of IoT in agriculture. So we're starting to see solutions that are built for monitoring field crops with the help of sensors. So they can detect things like light, humidity, the soil mo moisture, the crop health, and then do automated irrigation. So IoT can really help with thinking of all the layers of information that are need to be considered when we're conserving something like water. And you can see how powerful this could be, especially in areas where every drop matters or in places like California where our farmers don't have enough water. They feel like, so to be able to have this intelligence on the best time to water, taking into account the moisture in the air, the amount of light signal it's received. And we're starting to now see how even soil health could be analyzed down to the micro, microbial activities that it's, that it's experiencing inside of the soil itself to be able to deliver that information to farmers. So we started to see this in China, even where there's things like soil sensors that can commit and deliver data and could de deploy things like nutri nutrient boost or organic pesticides. And we're starting to see that in China, one of the bigger issues is just all the soil being contaminated with things like heavy metals and the amount of pesticides being used quite heavily. And so there's a wave now happening there of organic farming and farms that are focused on on using less pesticides and remotely monitoring crops in a, in a new way with technology and IoT infrastructure. Another trend we're seeing is this idea of rethinking means of production. So for example, with greens, most of that is produced in the United States in Arizona and Northern California. But what happens when we keep seeing these areas experience extreme drought? We've seen a lot of innovation and investment in indoor greenhouses lately. So there's even talk about Amazon and Walmart investing in these areas because they own the most warehousing space in the United States. But there's also a lot of startups like Aero Farms um, that you see there on the left. They're in New Jersey. They use aluminum towers that rise about 36 feet inside these climate controlled warehouses. Um, and it almost looks like, you know, if you were storing a bunch of merchandise um, but instead they're storing lettuce inside of that warehouse or square roots where they actually produce it in shipping containers. So the whole goal is to protect the crops from extreme weather, from unpredictable weather, and to be able to have a food system that can survive if we do kind of get to a state where the conditions outside are just no longer, no longer encouraging that. Their facilities are 390% more productive than traditional field farms. So I think that's pretty interesting when you think of um, how much more they could potentially produce and also be able to provide these fresh food items um, years to come. So in terms of this idea of indoor production, it could potentially change the way crops are grown and consumed. So they could shrink these long distance food chains. So we could potentially grow things here that are normally grown in tropical environments by manipulating the humidity inside um, and have chemical inputs through kind of a natural growing process. Um, so there's white space to think about how this could work even at the household level. So I've started to see more of those vertical food containers. Um, they had some at South by Southwest a few years ago from Zoe de Chanel and some other brands that were trying to basically democratize for farming for places where maybe you can't grow it in your backyard or you don't have enough usable space or maybe your neighborhood doesn't allow you to have farming, to have a small plot of gardening there. And so how do you kind of bring that inside the home and then provide things like smart sensors and lights so that consumers can grow their own lettuce or grow their own herbs. So we're kind of really at the beginning stages of that. It's part of a niche thing to do, but overall it could be really interesting if, if every consumer, instead of a pantry, imagine like you have your own little library of lettuces and vegetables that you're growing inside of your home um, and the right kind of technology to enable even somebody who's not a gardener to be able to do that. So it could be interesting to think of, uh, of what a future vision could look like if we kind of relocalize a lot of these areas. Kind of on a different spectrum now from lettuce, we want to go back to this idea of the fishing industry overall. So the global demand for seafood is growing um, rapidly in the next two decades. Netflix released, as I mentioned earlier, some of these viral documentaries like Seaspiracy, where they talk about commercial fishing and overfishing and some of the countries that contribute to that and sort of this like fish mafia that's formed. But also thinking of even like fish farming causes lower levels of pollution and disease. And how could we potentially have more fish farms and look at the standards that they're using in order to think about how we can keep fish around over the next hundred years as well. So fish farming has a lot of challenges. Um, 
it can often pass diseases. So especially if you have maybe like salmon in the ocean and it kind of has access to a natural body of water, then it can actually pass on a disease to salmon that live in the wild. So there was actually a disease where this happened um, that almost devastated the Pacific salmon population overall. So there is a huge, um, which was kind of an interesting thing to honestly learn about more was just that there's a lot of pests that can happen in agriculture, um, just like can happen in plants and different kinds of funguses and they sort of like sea pests that happen. But we're also seeing such a huge demand grow for more fish, especially as consumers try to eat more plant-based and as we have some growing populations is that how can we start to think about growing fish differently and even think about how do we start to control some of those dynamics if we are going to be able to farm them and be able to maintain the temperatures that they need to live at. So with the oceans warming, that's another threat to a lot of these cold water fishes that we rely on now. So with meat, so kind of uh, again on the opposite side of fish, um, with meat specifically, that always is a very hot topic when we talk about sustainability and where we often see a lot of innovation happening is how to reimagine what our meat experience looks like when it's beyond burger and impossible burger. It has led to a lot of things like destruction of the rainforest um, that are cleared for cattle, the draining of a lot of lakes and rivers. So this can often feel very disencouraging when we think of meat consumption overall. Livestock production accounts for about 15% of all greenhouse gases globally. So it's definitely an area where there's a lot of innovation of how do we reduce that. We also covered this on one of our other panels we talked about, but oftentimes we think of cancer as sort of the biggest risk that we'll face in our lifetime in terms of health, but cardiovascular disease is actually the number one killer in the world. And I've actually read a lot of literature and expert, expert opinion on that that's the number one thing most people should be concerned about versus cancer, because that's the one thing that tends to creep up on people. And it's to a certain extent outside of genetics is, is controllable. So there's a high, there's a high correlation with excessive meat consumption. That's often a lot of the plant-based dieting books that, um, that you'll read. They often talk about that correlation and how they really strongly believe that when you reduce your meat consumption, that's a lot of those societies that have the centurions and the blue zone eating is they very, they eat very little meat, if any at all, um, besides a little bit of fish and maybe a little bit of, um, when I read the blue zone diet book, a lot of it was like a little bit of pork, a little bit of meat, like lamb here and there, but for the most part, um, no cow and, you know, except maybe on a very rare special occasion. So we're starting to see this correlation with health, which has led to a lot of innovation, um, in the United States on startups that are starting to rethink how to grow meat and how do you start to manipulate some of the maybe then not the negative health connotations that it has with it or create a plant-based version. So Upside Foods, which was formerly known as Memphis Meats, they're the world's first startup to grow meat in a laboratory using tiny samples of muscle fat and connective tissue. Lab-grown meat eliminates a need for slaughter, but it's still a meat option for those who want to enjoy meat but care about animal welfare. The author acknowledges that she feels like we'll never completely eradicate consumption, that there's so many consumers that are meat eaters that love meat, but that at a future state, it could become so cost prohibitive that a lab created option or a plant-based option might be the most widely available. We're also seeing some startups look at how to create starter cells that really mimic this bio or that are simulating the biomimicry of the process of how it would develop in animals. And that's how they're able to create products that have the same textural effect. So now there's companies doing that in seafood too. So Finless Foods, they're creating cultured tuna, which I will say tuna has its own issues. Um, I was reading that a lot of times uh, they don't test for heavy metals in tuna. And so there's actually a lot more heavy metal contamination that people are eating in most conventional tuna products. And Tony Robbins actually almost died from heavy metal contamination because he was eating tuna several times a week as a plant-based diet. And he found that it was because it's sort of unregulated how often they're tested and then it's inaccurate. So there's a lot of these food items that are just becoming more contaminated, even with things like heavy metals. And so that has led to even somebody wanting to eat a, maybe a lab created seafood product or a product that they feel is going to be a bit safer. So we're kind of at the beginning stages of that. Superfoods are superheroes. So an area that we like to talk about in the wellness space um, is that we're starting to see these new superfoods emerge from these dry tropical regions. So 
So superfoods like moringa could feed large undernourished populations and have more of that nutritional impact um, versus we often think of things like staple crops, like rice and stuff, you know, provide carbohydrates, but overall not providing a ton of nutrition outside of energy units. So moringa is one where it's a very kind of eccentric and Dr. Seussian appearing tree that's native to dry tropical environments. Um, it's considered a superfood because it's rich in protein, iron, amino acids. It has very incredible anti-inflammatory effects and the tree leaves are very hearty and nutritious enough to become a stable food source. So we're starting to see some of these superfoods in the Western space um, in terms of powders where they can be added to smoothies. But innovators could also think about this as how do we use this in things like plant-based burgers or other meal items to really boost that nutrition and that protein boost. Um, and start to think of crops differently. So how could we start to think some of these challenges and look for these kind of crops that thrive in these arid, dry environments um, and think of how we can merge them with some of these lab created solutions that we've talked about today. Um, we've also seen some hip foods that are, I think not desirable to a lot of us, but um, could be interesting to think about is things like crickets um, and insects as a protein substitute and how there's sort of this like endless amount of bugs that could be leveraged um, to create new types of snacks and food options that also have a good health benefit. And the last trend in this section that we'll talk about is this idea of personalized and printed. So we've seen the trend of 3D printing in fashion and in shoemaking, but now we're starting to see it more in the food space and how could we create on-demand meals so this one specifically was a model that was for, um, for soldiers and for thinking about um, fighters, nutrient requirements on demand, but also this technology has been tested at different kinds of um, laboratories and places where um, there are cafeterias. And it hasn't been at a mass scale yet, but I have seen some franchises, I believe in Berkeley and San Francisco that were focused on lab or we're focused on 3D printing burgers. So there are some, some initial kind of beta testers out there, but definitely not widespread by any means yet. So it'll be interesting to see where this goes. So Foodini is the first commercially made 3D food printer. Um, it was designed, was pioneered by the US Army. We see this idea of personalizing food comes from the ancient concept of the dosha and personalizing down to your body constitution, which I thought was a really interesting connection because we obviously often hear about personalization in every category, but where to kind of that initial concept come from. And when we think of our diets and how we can start to formulate the specific needs, it's interesting to see how 3D printing and customized diet could converge into one another. So there's work being done looking into sensors that'll monitor stress levels, microbiome health, immune health. Um, I know they already have sensors for blood sugar monitoring that people are already trialing. Abbott has a product that does that as an example. So how do you start to get the input that you need of kind of what exactly you need? And then could the 3D printers potentially be the apothecary blending those customized supplements into food paste and printing different kinds of bars and pellets? It's interesting too with the bar space because bars has really been outpacing a lot of other category growth and has become a very sizable space. And if you think of a bar that seems like a relatively, like a format that would be acceptable to a consumer coming out of a 3D printer, so it could be really fun to think about a future where you're able to print your own snack items, your own bars, and you're able to add customized nutrition to that product. So based on everything that we just covered, and I know that was a lot, and per usual, the chat is alive and well. And as we wrap up here, we would love to ask, which of these trends really pulled you in and made you want to learn more? There's a lot of options here. Let us know which one is really intriguing to you, which one you would want to dig in even further and learn more. All right, I see the info pouring in here, 3D printing, robotics, all right, IoT, aquatics, means of production. Fantastic, well, maybe this will inspire a future discussion EBCO covers things in all types of formats. So we will capture these interest areas and perhaps it'll inspire us for a future webinar. So here's where we come in. Innovation and ignorance got us to this mess that we've made of our food system. And innovation combined with, combined with good judgment 
can get us out of it. And we are the innovators. And I would love to say that we all have good judgment to the best of our abilities. And we are the ones who are here to solve this. So in conclusion, as we wrap today, thank you everyone for joining us. We see that there's a lot that can be done to revolutionize the food industry, agriculture, and production in ways that are good for the environment and consumers. This book has left us optimistic. And as innovators, we're thinking of ways that we can lead with solutions and improve communities and break new ground for industries across categories. Please send us your feedback or any last minute comments in the chat that inspired you today. As we conclude here, thank you everyone for your participation in our book club. You know how much it means to us. I want to make a few announcements. We do have our outside in video series coming out soon. And what's really exciting about this is you are going to hear from individuals that we have worked with. So the outside in part is people that we've partnered with in companies like your own in positions like you, you will hear what it is like to work with EBCO from the other side. So that will be an awesome series coming soon. Our news directors panel is coming out next week. We've been rolling these out. They've been really exciting. If you haven't been to one yet, you'll see some information coming to your email. These are amazing conversations between our senior level trend directors uh, talking amongst each other. We've covered the metaverse so far. We've covered wellness. And next week, we're going to be covering Gen Z. And then we also have an inflation webinar coming out that has a lot of hot topics that are relevant literally today and probably over the next six months or so. We'll be in FEI in October, by the way. Also, I'm encouraging everyone to sign up for a trend mapping session. As you, as you may have heard, we run these. They're super exciting. They're free and they are custom to you. We will go over fractals and trends that we are seeing impacting your specific area, initiative, whatever is interesting to you at this moment. So reach out to Catherine at theebco.com for a free trend mapping session. These have been wildly popular. So we encourage you to do one with us. They're super fun. And then finally, end of year research requests. Right now we are running expeditions, immersion workshops, trend investigations, we're doing scouting. If you have end of year budget, we are a great person, a great group, a great team to partner with. We have space open for some expeditions, for some conclusive trend reports that we can wrap up by the end of the year. We can also help with budget planning for next year if there's some initiatives that you're considering end of your ideations in person and virtual. We're actually heading to Japan. We're heading to Boston, just to name a few of the expeditions we have coming up. So if you're thinking of any new business areas or filling your pipeline, we would love to talk with you as we head into Q4, which, oh my, starts in a week from Saturday. We are entering Q4. I hope that gives you all of the fun holiday vibes, as well as a little bit of the jitters of how we are going to wrap this year super successfully. So please uh, reach out to to EBCO and we would love to support you in any way possible. So thank you everyone for joining our webinar. It means so much to us and we look forward to the many ways we will be engaging with all of you as we wrap up 2022 in the next three months and head into 2023. So thank you so much for coming everyone.